So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Culture Studies where we are looking at Dick Hebdige's uh, text Subculture, the meaning of style. So uh, we are just looking at the introduction quite carefully because I think that is a very important section to look at in terms of how uh, he traces the his history, the historical birth of culture studies as a discipline in academia and how the different strands uh, of investigation which uh, inform culture studies, the Arnoldian strands, so, you know, Raymond Williams stance and then how semiotics comes into being as a major investment, as a major participator uh, in cultural studies. He draws in Barthes quite a bit. And the last session that we covered uh, in the lecture that we just had before this, uh, he looks at ideology as uh, a mechanism, ideology as a very uh, surreptitious and subterranean mechanism which appears, uh, you know, outside the threshold of consciousness. You are not conscious of ideology. Uh, while you are replicating it, while you are internalizing it, uh, while you are consuming it um, sometimes unquestioningly. And he drew on Marx, um, some of the early works on Marx and Angels and of course then uh, later on uh, he, he draws on Althusser in terms of how you know, ideology can be a psychological internalization which appears below consciousness. It does not sort of come at the threshold of consciousness but appears below consciousness as a, a system of thought, system of practices, rituals. So, uh, at the last session he stops at the point where it begins to formulate hegemony uh, and how he draws on Gramsci's understanding of hegemony as some kind of a, a mode of control, uh, discursive control uh, which is uh, obviously in keeping with the dominant uh, ideology. So, uh, hegemony and ideology are quite connected uh, at, an, at a discursive level uh, and sometimes quite organically so and we saw how in the previous section when it talks about Marx and Engels, um, their formulation of ideology, it was quite clear that uh, the mental domination and the economic domination, they go quite hand in hand. So, whoever, whichever group, whichever sessions of people, they control the economy, they control the money, they control the um, distribution of wealth. Uh, they also axiomatically tend to control uh, the distribution of mental thought processes, so, you know, which inform culture at a collective level. So, by thought processes, I mean a collective thought processes. So, whichever group uh, has more clout, has wields more power, more authority, more agency financially and economically, they tend to wield more power, uh, you know, mentally as well as uh, ideologically. So, hegemony is a very important term in culture studies, not least because it, it helps us understand how certain kinds of domination comes into being, come into being. Uh, so, domination as a discursive strategy, domination as an ideological strategy, uh, domination as a linguistic strategy, uh, cultural strategy of course. Uh, hegemony is that kind of a mode, uh, the modus operandi uh, if you will uh, of domination. How does domination work? How does domination operate um, you know, ontologically as well as uh, functionally? So, this section is a very interesting take on hegemony and it draws in Gramsci's work quite a bit because Gramsci was one of the first theorists, perhaps the first theorist who systematized uh, an understanding, a study of uh, hegemony as a collective activity. So, it opens with a quotation which should be on the screen, a uh, quotation from Brecht uh, uh, from this uh, text called the short uh, organum for the theatre. Now, Brecht of course as you know was a profoundly political uh, theatre writer and it talks about uh, how a collective consciousness is formed in a theatre and how you can interrupt that collective consciousness um, to different kinds of style and the Brechtian style of theatre is quite different from the um, Aristotelian style of theatre. The Brechtian theatre is very anti uh, it relies more on interruptions, it relies more on breaks, uh, it breaks the fourth wall, it addresses the audience directly. It moves away from a seamless representation of events uh, and it still highlights its own constructed quality, it highlights its own uh, um, discursive quality. So, when you are watching a Brechtian theatre, you are you're profoundly and immediately aware that you are watching an artifice, you know, a literary artifice, a theatrical artifice. So, the artificiality of the theatre, the theatrical production process is highlighted constantly in Brecht's um, uh, offer of work. And sometimes that informs the plot. Now, the very plot of Brechtian theatre sometimes relies on this highlighting of artificiality. Okay, so this section where Brecht mentions society cannot share a common communication system so long as it is split into warring classes. That is the beginning of the uh, section on, on hegemony that um, uh, Hebdige is sort of looking at. So, uh, 
he defines, he gives a provisional, a working definition of hegemony in this particular section where he says the term hegemony refers to a situation in which a provisional alliance of certain social groups can exert total social authority over other subordinate groups, not simply by coercion or by the direct imposition of ruling ideas, but by the winning and shaping consent, so that the power of the dominant classes appears both legitimate and natural. So, we are back to this very um, common uh, common practice of legitimizing and naturalizing power. So, what we're looking at is two forms of uh, domination. One is by uh, domination, one is by coercion, where you are aware that this is domination, you're aware that this is something which has been forced upon you. The other more surreptitious, more subliminal and perhaps more successful form of domination is through consent, where you become a consensual consumer of domination. You, you, you become a collaborator of domination. You are happy to be dominated because you realize, I mean, you're made to realize through a very interesting mental system, a very interesting ideological system, that this particular domination is legitimate, natural and perhaps benevolent. Uh, so this, this idea, this narrative of legitimization, benevolence, naturalization, these become very important um, categories of domination, especially uh, domination at a colonial level, domination at a racial level, domination at a gender level. So, you know, patriarchy operates through consent in more ways than one. So consent becomes a very important discursive condition uh, of legitimization and naturalization. And this is Stuart Hall saying this, but obviously, uh, any idea, any uh, study of uh, domination, any study of um, uh, hegemony would require uh, an attention to these two different strands of uh, uh, control, um, coercion and consent. So hegemony can only be maintained so long as the dominant classes succeed in framing all competing definitions within the range, so that subordinate groups are, if not controlled, then at least contained within an ideological space which does not seem at all ideological, which appears instead to be permanent and natural, to lie outside history, to be beyond particular interests. So this is how uh, domination works, this is how hegemony works, when subordinate groups are controlled and contained within one monolithic ideological system. And more importantly, that ideological system must not appear ideological in the first place. This is something which we have discussed um, extensively already, that the appearance of uh, um, this ideological quality must not be there. I mean, it must appear natural, seamless, spontaneous, organic, uh, and hence legitimate by default, uh, naturalized by default. So this process of naturalization is something which is a uh, sign qua non, uh, an essential condition of any kind of ideological coercion, any kind of ideological consent, any kind of ideological hegemony. So hegemony requires uh, this, um, you know, this effacement of this constructed quality of ideology. Hegemony requires a legitimization, a pseudo legitimization of course. Uh, hegemony requires this appearance of permanence and naturalness. And this appearance of permanence and naturalness is very important uh, for the purpose of our discussion over here. Uh, for that, it, to lie outside history, to be beyond particular interest. So, it should not appear topical and it's the same in a way for uh, any grand narrative. So if you look at any grand narrative, it must not appear particular, it must not appear topical, it must appear to be outside of history, it must appear to be timeless in quality, uh, something which transcends uh, immediate micro-historical interest, something which is permanently good, permanently benevolent, permanently uh, given, permanently naturalized, permanently uh, legitimized. Okay, so this is the long and short of how uh, hegemony operates uh, as an ideological practice, which is something that is uh, highlighted in this section. This is how, according to Barth, uh, mythology performs this vital function of naturalization and normalization, and it is in his book Mythologies that Barth demonstrates most forcefully the full extension of these normalized forms and meanings. So, uh, this particular book had been referred to already by Hebdige in an earlier section, uh, Mythologies by Rola Barth, why he sees quite clearly how, uh, you know, the study that Barth gives is a semiotic study, but of course it's a profoundly uh, political study as well, why he says that how these ideas of naturalization and normalization take place in society to different semiotic systems, to different forms of, um, you know, seamlessness, different forms of normalization. Uh, and this is how mythologies are formed, uh, and mythologies are by definition unquestionable. So how does something become a myth? How does something become, a, you know, a myth in, which is subscribed to by a collective, by uh, different kinds of people who participate in it, consume in it, uh, consume it uh, consensually? So this consensual, uh, you know, consumption of myths is something that Bart highlights, you know, 
insistently and uh, very persuasively and very competently in this particular book, Mythologies. Uh, however, Gramsci adds an important proviso that hegemonic power precisely because it requires the consent of the dominant majority, the dominated majority, sorry, that is a consent, that is where the consent must come from, the dominated majority, can never be permanently exercised by the same alliance of class fractions. As has been pointed out, hegemony is not universal and given to the continuing rule of a particular class. It has to be won, reproduced, sustained. Um, hegemony is, as Gramsci said, a moving equilibrium containing relations of forces favorable or unfavorable to this or that tendency. So hegemony, according to Gramsci, is a more uh, complicated process, a more complex phenomenon which must be acquired. And this process of acquiring hegemony is a very, uh, uh, the process of consolidating hegemony, it requires uh, collaboration from um, the economic component, the cultural component, the ideational component, they all must come together uh, to create this uh, consensus which then informs hegemony, uh, which is a, a moving equilibrium. Uh, it contains relations of forces favorable or unfavorable to this or that tendency. So tendency, forces, micro forces, these micro categories become very important in hegemony. And obviously what Gramsci is offering is a very complex an almost cognitive understanding of hegemony uh, by which these micro tendencies, these micro tensions are highlighted constantly. So hegemony doesn't appear just as a monolithic uh, given. It, it's, it's actually a, a summation, it's actually a combination of different components of different categories which come together. Class, for instance, economy, uh, language, culture, religion, so all these things come together and, and it contains, a, a, creates a moving equilibrium. And its creation of a moving equilibrium is something which is uh, highlighted uh, by Gramsci throughout his discourse. In the same way, forms cannot be permanently normalized. They can always be deconstructed, demystified by a mythologist like Barthes. So, you know, th this is the whole point of textuality. This is something which I may have already mentioned in this course that uh, no text uh, is permanently normalized. So, every grand relative is obviously textual in quality, uh, but then it becomes uh, a granularity precisely by effacing its textuality, effacing its constructed quality, concealing its constructed quality um, very successfully. That's the part of the package, part of the condition of becoming a grand relative. So forms can be permanently normalized. They can always be deconstructed. Uh, so every form can be deconstructed, demystified. Uh, so deconstruction also requires a form of demystification, right? So demystification is like taking away the mythological component, taking away the myth of meaning, taking away the myth of dominant meaning. So that's what demystification is. So when Barth, for instance, when he offers his book on mythology, it's what he's essentially doing is he's deconstructing myths, he's deconstructing the grand narratives which inform myth making, myth formation or the meaning making which uh, in, uh, is invested into this uh, idea, this map of myths. Uh, moreover, commodities can be symbolically repossessed in everyday life and endowed with implicitly oppositional meanings by the very groups who originally produced them. So this idea of repossession is obviously uh, an act of appropriation. So any commodity can be repossessed with different semantic value, right? So when you re repossess something, you give it a different semantic value at a collective level. So a commodity can take up different uh, semantic registers at different points of time. Uh, so for instance, just to give you an example, a very common popular example of say, a hoodie jacket, right? A hoodie jacket is something which is, uh, was originally uh, used by people who belong to a subordinate group, not the elite. But then a hoodie jacket is, can then be appropriated and become an elite symbol. Uh, it becomes a bit of a cool symbol. So the idea of the cool commodity is very important, uh, especially in the study of subculture as uh, uh, Dick Hebditch offers the way out. The cool quotient, the coolness of a commodity is precisely because of its um, flexibility, plasticity as a commodity through which it can be possessed and repossessed and given, and given different semantic registers at different points of time. The symbiosis in which ideology and social order, production and reproduction are linked is then neither fixed nor guaranteed. So this symbiosis, almost organic symbiosis uh, between production, reproduction, and social order, uh, ideology, um, so ideology of course is a combination of all these things. But this symbiosis is neither fixed nor guaranteed. This symbiosis is textual and quality. It can be deconstructed, it can be demystified, and it can be reproduced, repossessed, reappropriated with different linguistic and cultural uh, and ideological registers. It can be priced open. The consensus can be fractured, challenged, overruled, 
and resistance to the groups and dominance cannot always be lightly dismissed or automatically incorporated. Uh, so any consensus can be overruled, any consensus can be fractured, any consensus which informs uh, the consent about hegemony can be fractured. So when he's saying consensus can be fractured, challenged, overruled and resistance can be um, you know, dismissed, cannot be dismissed, it's lightly incorporated. What he's saying is that consensus too is textual and quality. So this entire idea of consent, uh, the other component of hegemony, uh, so question and consent. So consent at a collective level, uh, it can be changed, it can uh, sort of be fractured, it can be overruled, overturned, so consent can become dissent very, very quickly uh, to a certain uh, phenomena, to certain events, to certain uh, you know, practices, certain rituals, certain forms of knowledge. Uh, so uh, this is a very interesting cognitive psychological as well as cultural study of consent at a collective level. And this is what I mentioned at the very inception of the course, if you remember that and one of the beauties of the course is that it draws on so many disciplines. So it draws on psychology for instance, it draws on uh, political science, it draws on obviously I mean, the study of culture, this is why it's called cultural studies. But the point is if we are to do our complex reading of culture, if we are to offer uh, or formulate or systematize a complex reading of culture, which is what culture studies is, then it must uh, be, uh, it must entail a degree of interdisciplinarity. It must bring in together different disciplines, which can be at a dialogic level with each other in terms of looking at culture as a complex phenomenon. Okay, uh, now he mentions Lefebvre, Henry Lefebvre, who is a space theorist, uh, but uh, very important for the purpose of us in cultural studies because uh, he talks about how space becomes discursive in quality, how space becomes uh, you know, stylistic and stylized in quality, uh, and how space obviously is coded at a semiotic level, uh, which makes it illogical, political, and subversive, sometimes uh, simultaneously. Although, as Lefebvre has written, we live in a society where objects and practice become science and science objects, and of second nature takes the place of the first. The initial layer of perceptible reality, you know, there are, as it goes on to affirm, always objections and contradictions which hinder the closing of the circuit b between sign and object, production and reproduction. So Lefebvre gives a very uh, complex understanding of science and objects, uh, right? So objects become signs, signs then become objects, and the second nature takes the place of the first. Uh, and, uh, but then he also mentions there are objections and contradictions. Uh, which uh, you know, resists any kind of closure, the closure of the circuit. So the circuit over here is obviously the circuit of meaning making, uh, the circuit of signification. And this circuit of signification must resist any closure, and, and it doesn't really have any closure. It always has objections and contradictions between sign and object, production and reproduction. So there's always a, a, a schism between production and reproduction, something that's lost, something that's gained. So every act of production, every act of reproduction, every act of appropriation, is by default an act of misappropriation. Uh, is either overappropriation or uh, sort of um, you know, uh, insufficient appropriation. And so this is something which, which even Homi Baba talks about at a different level. So we have some structural parallels there. I mean, Baba talks about mimicry uh, at a colonial level uh, in, in very similar terms. So uh, this is again a very post structuralist way of looking at meaning production, where he's saying that between the meaning and the object and the sign and the object is always a slippage. It's always a uh, um, you know, a resistance to its closure of the circuit. So the circuit of meaning making, the circuit of signification must always be slippery by default. So production and reproduction, uh, it, it always has a schism between them. Uh, likewise, the sign and the object do um, you know, have schisms between them in terms of, uh, you know, it's not a seamless process of signification. It must always be slippery, it must always be, uh, you know, there always must be a shadow between the sign and the object, and that shadow must take on different appropriations and different linguistic and uh, semantic registers. So uh, this idea of Lefebvre is very important because Lefebvre is obviously giving a very uh, post-structuralist idea of meaning making, meaning process, uh, materialization, and this is something that uh, Bart seems to anticipate uh, in a more structuralist study, which is materialist. But if you look at later Bart's works, uh, when it sort of tends to become more post-structuralist, then he's talking about the slippage between the sign and the, uh, the object, between the signifier and the signified, and the slippage always uh, produces more and more meanings, produces uh, multiplicity of meanings uh, which resist any closure. Uh, the level of the semantic circuit. The semantic circuit doesn't have any closure at all and must just become more and more slippery, must plastic, more and more plastic in quality. 
So, we can now return, as Hebditch says, we can now return to the meaning of youth subcultures. This is what the book is about. Youth subcultures, so different sub-narratives, the different uh, subtexts that operate uh, within a particular umbrella term of culture. Uh, you know, so, youth subculture becomes a very important category, a very important uh, subcategory, a microcategory in cultural studies because youth subcultures is where uh, this act of appropriation, excuse me, and misappropriation, overappropriation, anxiety uh, to appropriate, they operate uh, at most visibly because you know, there's, all, all, there's also an aspirational quality about this asp appropriation. So, there's always um, anxiety about this appropriation, there's always a sense of loss uh, about this appropriation. So, youth subcultures become a very fertile, very fecund field of uh, study for uh, cultural studies, for us uh, interested in cultural studies. For the emergence of such groups has signaled in a spectacular fashion the breakdown of consensus in a post-war period. So this idea of the breakdown of consensus, this is something which you've heard before, haven't we? Uh, especially when you looked at Leotard, when you looked at the idea of the loss of the public space uh, post-war period, so post-Second World War. Um, the public space of the space. There's no consensus uh, at a collective level in the public space, which is a very uh, heavy Muslim way of looking at um, society, where there must be a, you know, a public space, uh, there must be a project of consensus, there must be uh, an agreement, uh, you know, a consensus at a collective level, at an ideational level for culture to operate. So, you know, that's why Habermas talks about modernity as an unfinished project, which is something which is contested by Lyotard in the postmodern condition which we have already covered. But then we have a similar kind of a illusion over here, where you know, Hebditch says quite clearly that this breakdown of a consensus happened in the post-war period, right? So there's no consensus in the post-war period. There's no public space in the post-war period as a result of which, um, you know, we have this different uh, micro subcultures which come into being, which contest, which subvert, and which also inform this idea of culture that we consume today. In the following chapters, this is his laying out the map of the book over here. In the following chapters, we shall see that it is precisely objections and contradictions of the kind which Lefebvre has described the fine expression in subculture. However, the challenge to hegemony which subcultures represent is not issued directly by them. Rather, uh, it is expressed obliquely in style. The objections are lodged, um, the contradictions displayed, and as we shall say, magically resolved at the profoundly superficial level of appearances, that is, at the level of science. So, superficiality becomes a very um, uh, important condition if a postmodernism, as we may have seen already in Lyotard and, and some of the other texts that we have covered so far. Because at a superficial level, we see the slippage of science, we see, we see the play of science most spectacularly. Uh, you know, how science becomes an you know, object, objects become science, and it all happens at a superficial level, which is uh, what makes this whole, and the whole exchange, the whole semantic exchange, so postmodern, so post-structuralist in the first place. So, uh, the profoundly superficial level of appearances is where, you know, the science operates as a level of science. That's where the slippage between uh, the object and the commodity, between the commodity and its semantic register, uh, they come into being. Uh, and that's how cultural uh, myth-making is formed at a very superficial level. So, in a sense, uh, what we see over here in Dick Hebdige's uh, analysis is quite true to the spirit of postmodernism, which sometimes becomes a celebration of superficiality. But that particular superficiality can be subversive in quality, but it can also sometimes be uh, complicit in quality, complicit in status quo, complicit in the consolidated understanding of culture. So, this uh, uh, entire ambivalence between being complicit and being subversive at a superficial level is what characterizes postmodernism as a movement, a uh, display between superficiality uh, you know, being subversive and superficiality being complicit. Uh, and we're never quite sure uh, how to map all the differences between the two. So, in that sense, uh, postmodernism is never completely subversive, uh, neither is it completely um, uh, complicit in quality. Uh, that's something which this ambivalence is what uh, informs postmodernism as a spirit. Uh, as a movement in general. For the sign community, uh, as Hebdige goes on to say, for the sign community, the community of myth consumers is not a uniform body. So, uh, there's a lack of uniformity even within the consumers. So, the, the people who consume the myths, people who consume different kinds of uh, you know, science systems, uh, myth systems, and they're not uniform in quality. So, different kinds of different orders of consumption, the same object, the same uh, methodology, the same commodity. As Volosinov has written, it is cut through by class. So, class becomes a very important factor in terms of how we attach ourselves to science. So, our class position, our location and culture, uh, to use a phrase from Homi Bhabha, uh, is 
dependent on our class position. So what is a class position and how does it make us, um, does it make us privileged consumers, does it make us um, uh, poor consumers, does it make us unprivileged, underprivileged, subordinated, uh, subjugated consumers? It depends on location and class. Uh, and uh, it's more complex than that as well. It's, there are actually more factors which come in apart from just class. But the philosophy of OER highlights the class location in terms of the uh, mid consumers. Class does not coincide with the science community, that is, with the totality of users of the same set of science of ideological communication. Thus, various different classes will use one and the same language. As a result, uh, differently oriented accents intersect in every ideological sign. Science becomes the arena of the class struggle. So the last sentence is very uh, beautifully written and at the same time quite uh, compelling in terms of its content. So science becomes the arena of the class struggle. So how do you deal with science? How do you appropriate science? Uh, that becomes the arena, that becomes the agon, the space uh, for class struggle because it depends on the class location, it depends on the, uh, you know, your particular, uh, you know, background, your particular location, a particular agentic situation in, in a particular class. The struggle between different discourses, different definitions and meanings within ideology is therefore always, at the same time, a struggle within signification. So what we see over here is a very interesting uh, dialogic relationship between uh, discursivity and the semantic register. Uh, discursivity and signification, right? So the struggle between different discourses, between uh, different definitions and meanings uh, within ideology uh, is a struggle with signification. How do you identify with science? How do you misidentify with science? How do you appropriate science? And that these appropriations, these misappropriations become quite discursive in quality. Not least because it depends, it reveals your location in class, it reveals your location in a particular uh, societal structure. A struggle for a possession of the sign which extends to even the most mundane uh, areas of everyday life. So how to possess a sign, how to consume a sign. So signs become commodities over here. And how do you negotiate with those commodities? How do you negotiate, how do you navigate with signs? How do you consume signs? And what does this consumption do to your agentic self? Uh, does it increase your agency as a self? Uh, does it undermine your agency? Never quite know. <clears throat> to turn once more to the examples used in the introduction, to the safety pins and tubes of Vaseline. So this was a reference which was used by Hebdige right at the beginning of this book. Uh, safety pins and tubes of Vaseline, two very banal commodities really. Uh, safety pins and Vaseline tubes. I mean, you don't really think much of them uh, in normal parlance. But uh, I mean, what he's offering over here is how these things, these commodities can take up different multiple linguistic and semantic registers uh, which can then become different kind of cultural signifiers depending on the, uh, the act of appropriation. We can see that such commodities are indeed open to a double inflection, to illegitimate as well as legitimate users. So, you know, the, the same object, the same sign can have an illegitimate appropriation, it can have a legitimate appropriation, depending on how the inflation operates. These humble objects can be magically appropriated, stolen by subordinate groups and made to, made to carry secret meanings, uh, meanings which express and code a form of resistance to the order which guarantees the continued subordination. So how uh, these things become stolen, uh, and by stolen he means uh, appropriated, uh, you know, over-appropriated, misappropriated, uh, how uh, these subordinate groups they carry secret meanings, right? So secret meanings mean double meaning. So this doubleness of meaning, this multiplicity of meaning is what makes the entire act of appropriation very, very interesting. So same object, safety pins or basement tubes that can be appropriated legitimately by the normal commonsensical, and I use the word common sense within brackets because that's obviously, that obviously comes from ideological investment, and also a non-commonsensical, hence illegitimate um, appropriation, and how the difference in appropriation can actually uh, generate difference in meanings uh, at a semantic level. So it depends on the act of appropriation, so it all comes down to the verb, the act, the activity. So in a sense, it's something similar to what um, Anna Butler had said about gender. How do you appropriate a certain uh, semantic code? How do you appropriate a certain kind of a social code that determines your gendered location in a particular society in uh, a particular point of time? Uh, so the word particular keeps coming out throughout my lectures, throughout this particular, there you go, course, but that's deliberate because uh, what it does, it talks about, it highlights the topicality, it highlights the uh, the location, uh, the local quality of any narrative, right? And hence, what particular is so important because uh, it, it just uh, effaces, it just goes against, it deconstructs uh, to a certain extent the, the grandness of meaning, the grandness of signification by sort of consistently highlighting or consistently uh, underlining 
uh, the topicality or the immediacy or the micro quality, the constructive quality of any act of appropriation or any act of uh, textualization. Okay, so um, meanings which express and code the, a form of resistance to the order which guarantees the continued subordination. Style in subculture is impregnant with significance. The style becomes a very uh, important semantic um, uh, register, which also becomes quite cultural and political in its scope. It, its transformations go against nature, interrupting the, the process of normalization. As such, they are gestures, movements towards a speech which offends the silent majority, which challenges the principle of unity and cohesion, which contradicts the myth of consensus. Our task becomes like bards to discern the hidden message, inscribe and code on the glossy surfaces of style, to trace them out as maps of meaning, which obscurely represent the very contradictions they are designed to resolve or conceal. So the maps of meaning uh, become the, the very patent, the very potent spaces where the different contradictions uh, are, you know, are sort of resolved or concealed at the same time. So our job as culture studies students, um, you know, if you're using semantics, if you're using semiotics, uh, is to study style. Because style becomes uh, then, uh, according to Hebditch, the superficial level of uh, signification where the different contradictions, different tensions are concealed and resolved and highlighted. But the style becomes a very important cultural metaphor, a cultural signifier. Style becomes uh, an index of uh, ideological investment. Uh, in more ways than one, which is what makes uh, a study of style such an important category of, um, you know, in, in sort of investigation, according to Hebditch. Uh, academics who adopt a semiotic approach are not alone in reading significance into located in the loaded surfaces of life. The existence of spectacular subcultures continually opens up the surfaces to other potentially subversive readings. So, you know, you can do more subversive readings. Um, if you study subcultures, because subcultures are those cultures, those microcultures which are beneath the dominant culture uh, and which, like postmodernism, as I just mentioned, can sometimes become uh, you know, complicit to the dominant culture and sometimes can become subversive uh, to the dominant culture. And this entire ambivalence between complicity and subversion is what uh, makes subculture such an important uh, category. And as a reference to Zor Jeanette, uh, um, that, you know, Hebditch mentions, and then he talks about how, uh, as a semiotic violation of social order, a movement attracts and will continue to attract attention, to provoke, uh, censor, and to act, and we shall see as a fundamental bearer of significance in subculture. So any movement of subversion, any movement of consolidation will always attract uh, attention, uh, provoke censor, uh, and to act. Sometimes it can be a trigger to for activity, sometimes it can be uh, you know, censored. Uh, if it goes against the entire dominant culture, but that becomes the significance of subculture uh, at a cognitive as well as a, at a cultural level. No subculture has sought with more grim determination than the punks uh, to detach itself uh, from the uh, taken for granted landscape of normalized forms. So the punk subculture is sometimes something that Ebdige is quite uh, interested in. And because the reason being is where the punk subcultures detach itself from the taken for granted landscape of normalized forms. It goes against the, uh, you know, the seamless landscape of normalization at a cultural level, the punk subculture. The punk subculture becomes a constant reminder uh, of the constructed quality, the, the artificial quality of culture. It sort of highlights its own artificiality. It becomes a spectacular artifice in its own way. Uh, not to bring down upon itself such a vehement disapproval. It, cops, it constantly mocks itself, it constantly uh, disapproves itself uh, vehemently. And as a result, it becomes a very post-structuralist performance, according to um, Hebditch. We shall begin, therefore, with the moment of punk, and we shall return to that moment throughout the course of the book. It is perhaps appropriate that the punks who have made such large claims for literacy, illiteracy, who have pushed profanity to such startling extremes, should be used to test some of the methods for reading science evolved in the centuries-old debate on the sanctity of culture. So it talks about the, uh, the, the appropriation of using, the appropriate quality uh, of using uh, punks, because you know, he says that the entire idea of the punk subculture uh, it, it sort of sets out to deconstruct the centuries-old debate on the sanctity of culture. So the entire idea of the sacral culture, the sacrality of culture is resisted and deconstructed by the punk movement, uh, which constantly keeps uh, 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 sort of highlighting its own um, sort of subversive, spectacular, 
superficial, shallow quality and shallowness and superficiality become very important uh, components in this act of subversion, especially when it comes to the punk subculture. And you just, the punk subculture is an example of how the subversion takes place. So that's the conclusion of the introduction of this particular book, uh, Subcultures by uh, Dick Hebdige. But what it, it does in a nutshell, in, in, a nutshell, in a summary, is it so brings our attention back to some of the things, some of the components, some of the issues which we have covered already and which we began with at the beginning of this course and then we touched upon those issues throughout this course as we dealt with some of the texts written by some of the writers uh, that we examined. So ideology, hegemony or common sense, these become very important categories of investigation, especially in culture studies and after this we move on to uh, Catherine Belsey's uh, investigation of common sense and how common sense in a detective novel becomes a very useful example of looking at uh, culture, especially uh, a very gendered use of culture, a very gendered sense of culture which we will cover in Belsey's book um, uh, Critical Practice which is a text which we will take up after this. But Hebdige is a very important figure in a study of, in, in, a, in a culture studies discipline because A, uh, he gives you a historical sense of cultural studies as a discipline, how it came into being. It talks about different strands within cultural studies. It talks about different ideological and uh, the different disciplinary investments in cultural studies from psychology, semiotics, structuralism, etc. And then he's one of the first, he's one of the most prominent writers who keeps flagging up, who keep flagging up actually, uh, the very, very uh, sort of interdisciplinary quality of uh, cultural studies. It draws on psychology, it draws on um, of film studies, it draw, draws on popular culture. It is a magnificent section on David Bowie in this particular book. Those of you interested in the idea of um, uh, you know, Bowie as a subversive figure uh, in music uh, in the 70s and 80s uh, phenomenon uh, should read this particular book. It's, it's a massive uh, study of Bowie uh, and I find that very, very interesting as well. But at a more general level, uh, it gives us a sense of how ideology operates and an understanding of culture. It gives us a sense of how uh, hegemony operates in the study of culture and how hegemony, ideology, common sense, you know, uh, consent, coercion, so all these things come together uh, and you know, collaborate uh, towards the consolidation of culture. And then how the consolidation is actually very topical, very temporal in quality and it draws in uh, Gramsci at the end uh, to corroborate the temporality of such um, you know, consensus and he says quite clearly that such consensus can be fractured, overruled, overturned uh, by different phenomena, by different movement and you know those, uh, those instances of overturning and overruling, uh, they highlight, they bring forth to us the textuality of such consensus uh, at, at a semantic level and also the collective cultural level. So this particular book, uh, not least in the introduction that we have covered, is a very important uh, text for us in cultural studies, one which keeps reminding us of the different components, the different discursive investments in culture and how uh, we should be, we as students of culture studies uh, should be examining those investments at a textual, semantic as well as at a uh, sort of collective level. Uh, and because these things uh, affect us not just uh, as an, at an academic arena but also at a, at a daily immediate lift reality of existence which we inhabit and consume and internalize every day. So with that we conclude uh, Dick Hebdige's uh, introduction to subculture which again as I mentioned is a very important text for us, is a very important sort of reminder and this is why I chose to study it at this point in this course where we're winding up because it helps us to summarize and go back to and rehearse some of the things which we have which we had set out at the very inception of this course. Uh, and after this, we move on to uh, Catherine Belsey's critical practice where we look at the um, idea of opacity and transference here, things which have been talked about already by Hebdige. But, you know, Belsey gives a more, uh, sort of a more detailed examination of those things and how she was an example of Sherlock Holmes, uh, very interestingly, Sherlock Holmes as a detective figure, how Sherlock Holmes becomes a very important example of realism and also a crisis in realism which is an index of common sense uh, as a construct, as an ideological construct, which is the text that we will take up in the next lecture, uh, Catherine Belsey's uh, critical practice. But with this, we conclude Dick Hebdige's text. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you.